Welcome to the Bonfire Podcast. I am Morgan, aka Bon Diesel, and this week we'll be talking about the Dead Space 2 remake that never existed. Blizzard is back in China. The Fallout show is awesome, and much more. So sit back, relax, and let's have a chat around the bonfire. Yeah, so prepping this show was interesting. Um, There's some stuff that I'm excited to talk about, but I think overall it was a pretty quiet week. Naturally, we had layoffs. We had the bad news, right? Um, We also had some good stuff. I think um, some kind of curious stuff, some people... Uh, taking L's, but not really taking them. And uh, overall, uh, a somewhat interesting week in gaming. Uh, And at least in my circles, we stopped hearing from people who need every single video game woman to be a uh, like an anime, uh, like sex doll or something. It's um, it's getting real weird in parts of the internet. But uh, Luckily, a combination of blocks and, uh, you know, working on my algorithm a bit has made that better. So I hope uh, you're doing okay in internet land, and uh, I'm excited to talk about some gaming news today. Uh, Before we get started, please subscribe to the Bond Diesel YouTube channel, hit the like button, and leave a thoughtful comment, or if you prefer, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and maybe even leave a review on iTunes or Spotify. Thank you to everyone who supports all of my content on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube with a special thanks to producer level supporter Hassan. If you are interested in supporting this podcast and all of my other content, please consider checking out the link tree link in the description of the show for all the ways you can do that. Gaming news. Let's get into it. Xbox. Uh, We had some interesting news uh, for Xbox this week. Um, NetEase and Blizzard, uh, who uh, I believe about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, um, cut off their relationship. Um, What you need to know about how things work in China is that foreign companies can't just operate independently in China, at least as far as I'm aware. I'm not going to pretend to know everything here, but I know enough to talk about it a little bit. So if you want to work or if you want to sell your product in China, you essentially have to um, kind of team up with a Chinese company. Um, The thing to realize about the way that China works is that they technically have private ownership of companies. There are CEOs and boards and all of that, similar to in the West and the United States and other Western countries. But there are a lot of industries and a lot of companies where there's at least some kind of overall ownership or responsibility to the CCP or the state government or the federal government for them. And that makes things a little complicated, right? And so the idea essentially is that foreign companies can technically operate in China's borders, but they need basically someone to sponsor them, basically. And there's always been some concerns about whether or not that's how uh, China can either, one, steal, you know, kind of uh, secrets of foreign companies uh, for various reasons or to just make sure, you know, from like a censorship perspective, make sure that foreign companies don't bring influences into their country that they don't want. No matter how you feel about such a practice or the reason they would do it, you know, is what it is. I'm here to talk about games. This is an interesting thing because what this does is this brings back like games like World of Warcraft uh, to China, where previously that was not officially true. Um, I I don't know. I, I'm going to be honest. I couldn't care less about World of Warcraft. Um, but I know how humans are, especially gamers. And I suspect people in China found a way to continue playing uh, World of Warcraft 
um, through, you know, sleuthing and so on. Um, but this makes it easier and it hopefully will be a good thing for everyone. Um, what I don't think is, was really talked about this, this week about this story is this is a, probably a pretty huge deal financially for Xbox and Blizzard. Um, you know, where Xbox has been taking some, you know, taking some L's this year, even though I think most of them are pretty exaggerated and sensationalized and, and kind of created, um, they still have at least in you know, the perception of some, um, but they've been doing a lot of things that are probably making them a lot of money. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that's the race. That's the goal, right? The other interesting thing about the story was that um, it included um, some kind of wording uh, that uh, s there's an agreement uh, to explore bringing other Xbox platforms, consoles and games to China. This is where I'm going to I'm completely out of my, you know, water. I, I think I remember at one point um, hearing that because of the restrictions. Um, I don't know if the PlayStation or Xbox are available in China. Um, PCs obviously are. And I and I don't, I don't know if there's consoles that they make natively um, or if maybe the, the Western consoles are there, um, maybe just not in great numbers. My impression is that the vast majority of gaming in China happens on PCs where I assume, you know, most hardware is fairly easy to get, especially because much of it's manufactured there, um, even though. Uh, there have been some recent issues with, um, I think, especially NVIDIA GPUs um, have to be like kind of uh, have hardware removed from them to be sold to China because China was scooping up NVIDIA GPUs uh, for AI purposes. So a bunch of interesting geopolitics, uh, geopolitical stuff that I don't know enough to speak on. And I don't want to bring into a gaming conversation, but it would really, really be interesting if we all of a sudden see um, Xbox be able to sell their consoles or at least increase their market there, um, especially if it's a fairly untapped market for consoles, even though you have to wonder if the culture of gaming there is very PC focused, whether a console would ever even get a second look. But we'll have to wait and see. Uh, we also got some Xbox um information uh they have set up a new game preservation and forward compatibility team um for all the kind of bad talk about xbox especially when it comes to you know comparing their exclusive first party titles to playstations and even nintendo's to a point um you know people really kind of harp on that and kind of dog on playstation for uh, or xbox for not being up to the same standard but man i and i've argued this for years Besides that, not to underplay how important that is, it is probably the most important thing is the games, but, but I really don't believe that PlayStation does anything else better than Xbox. I, you can, you could argue down to like hardware when it comes to controllers and stuff like that. Um, but when it comes to the way they treat backwards compatibility, the way that they treat just their general kind of systems, um, I, I really think they do it pretty, you know, in a pretty superior fashion. And that especially comes down to uh, backwards compatibility um, with all of the talk. We'll get to Fallout in a bit. Um, but with all of the talk about Fallout, I saw people saying like, oh, man, there's no way for me to play uh, Fallout 3 or New Vegas on PlayStation 4 or 5. And I was like, oh, there's no way that's true. Like that doesn't that doesn't make sense. Um, like surely those games, but they never released next gen versions for those games. Um, the PlayStation three had a proprietary, uh, CPU and architecture. Uh, and so did the Xbox 360. but because the Xbox one and the series systems had a big focus on backwards compatibility. Um, I, I honestly don't know what they do. I assume there's an emulator uh, built in. Um, they've been able to do backwards compatibility on almost everything where with PlayStation, they didn't do that. That's, um, you know, that's even been a thing talked about from, you know, upper management and executives at PlayStation. I mean, like who, no one cares about old games, which isn't true. And so, you know, uh, so you can't, uh, now you can stream it, 
because I believe a PlayStation streaming system can use, uh, I don't know if they have old PS3s um, in racks somewhere where you can stream from them, or more than likely there's an emulator they design that can work through streaming, but they don't put into their consoles. Um, so you, But you can't play it natively, which is just like crazy to me. Like, it just seems so weird that that's even possible. And it really reminds you of how different their philosophies are for better or worse, depending on how you look at it. But this dedication to moving forward, um, the thing to keep in mind, this is forward um, compatibility. This isn't backwards compatibility. So they're thinking today about how, about how they keep all the games that currently are playable in the future. And this comes in the same week that we see Ubisoft shutting down servers for the crew and even revoking licenses for it. Which means that even if before you know they, they shut down the servers, you downloaded it and wanted to try to figure out a way to play it, you can't. Um, that's a whole different discussion we'll get to maybe some other day. But I, I think this is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, it won't get the press and the attention that it deserves, um, which really sucks because it seems like so much of game media right now is focused on you know, only putting out stories about Xbox that are negative. It's fine. It's the tax as I once pushed back on and now kind of believe in. Um, but it is what it is. It's still it's a cool thing that they're doing. Um, we also found out, uh, I believe in emails that were around the compatibility, um, there's also an email from Sarah Bond that came out that talked about um, how Diablo 4's biggest platform uh, since coming to Game Pass uh, overall is Xbox, which is pretty surprising. I would ha I would just assume... PC would be the vastly, you know, larger player base. There's some something to be said there where one Game Pass surely boosted its numbers and two the people who were playing it on other platforms that number is probably lower, right? It's probably not huge right now um where the platform where it's new if you consider Game Pass a platform um very likely kind of, you know, the excitement there uh, is, is is telling that story. I loved Diablo 4. I loved the story campaign. I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then I'll never touch it again. I have no interest in the seasonal content. It's never going to happen. But I really like that game. It's a solid 8, 8.5 out of 10 for me. Um, the story, just playing through that and all the areas and the art, just great. Really, really liked it. And, um, and I'm happy I got to experience that. And I'm happy it's getting... Uh, you know, it's flowers now uh, in one way or another. Uh, Call of Duty Vanguard, uh, one of the lowest, rate, lowest rated games in the Call of Duty series, was announced to have sold over 30 million copies. That is such, just so insane because I have no interest in that game. Um, and it sounds like a lot of other people didn't either. And it still sold three to six times more copies than good games, than games that people love. I mean, it's just like, like for comparisons, I bet um, Baldur's Gate 3 is now the first game to have won every single major uh, Game of the Year award, right? I don't know if they've talked about sales numbers recently. It it's I, I believe it's over 10 if it sold 15 million copies, I'd be surprised. And it's a very good game. It's a very obviously good game, objectively, at this point. And there's a really good chance that Call of Duty Vanguard doubled it up. Maybe. Probably. It's just like, I, I think when the ABK acquisition for Xbox was happening, um, people you know, didn't, just didn't seem to quite like understand why they were doing it and how it would really help Xbox. And since then, you know, with them throwing a couple games on the PlayStation and, you know, they're devaluing their console, they're devaluing. You can make moves like they're moving when you have this. Uh, and even though Call of Duty isn't going to be exclusive, when, when you're going to pull in the money and you are and you currently are, pulling in the money that this gets you a crappy game selling 30 million copies you can make you can experiment and that's what they're doing um just crazy uh, i think this also highlights 
why it's um, it's such a big deal that they're going to be able to announce Call of Duty at their game showcase, likely in June. They're, you know, just the Call of Duty announcement, no matter how much people like to dunk on Call of Duty and say it's the same game every year and blah, 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 it still outsells your favorite game. And, you know, the announcement itself is an event every year. Even if you don't like Call of Duty, you probably know it's about to get announced. I think they typically do it in, in the late summer, early fall, and then release the game in October and November. I just don't think people understand the gravity of how big of a deal just the Call of Duty brand is for Xbox. Um, again, even though it's not going to be exclusive. Uh, at some point, whether it's the next game or not, which is supposed to be like a um, Gulf War era game, whether or not they can put it uh, on Game Pass, we'll see. Eventually they will. And that's huge. It, it just It's so big. It's arguably Call of Duty. The first time it gets to be day one on Game Pass will probably be its last like biggest jump in subscribers. Um, because people are going to, at least in my opinion see the value of yeah that's a great deal i can pay 15 bucks or whatever it is now play you know call of duty for a few months for less than i would have paid for it straight up and i can try out all these other games holy crap there's so many games i'm not having to buy them i'm gonna keep paying this money whether or not subscriptions are really a better deal is a you know a different discussion but i think call of duty especially is going to bring a ton of people into the fold and a lot of them will stay because it's a cool service, even if it's not for first party games. So Xbox has got some stuff going on. Um, I genuinely didn't find any PlayStation news this week that was uh, really worth going into. The only Nintendo news I found uh, was that Geo Corsi has joined Nintendo of America. They are the former head of commercial uh, at Iron Galaxy Studios, a PlayStation studio. Um, and they've joined Nintendo as the... Nintendo of America's AAA third-party portfolio management team. So whatever the F that means, but if anything, it just shows more of a commitment uh, to you know their Western audience with Nintendo likely staffing up, trying to get some experienced people in uh, in the next year before they release their next-gen console. I still have zero faith in this really being that impressive. I think it's, I mean, it's obviously going to be better than the Switch. I fully expect it to be kind of underwhelming at the end of the day and it's going to sell 100 million units <laughs> it's not going to matter um it, it's it, it's probably gonna even with a multiple year head start will probably outsell the xbox by the end of the first year maybe two uh, even though it's going to have like it's going to be you know four or five years behind in release it's just um N nintendo's a, a juggernaut and their method of staying out of the console war for the most part with PlayStation and Xbox has worked out for them. And I think it's why I've predicted for a while that you may see Xbox kind of exit that rat race as well. And it's going to leave all three of the major platforms kind of doing their own thing and uh, all making hardware. I still think even Xbox, but I think you're really going to see them go three different directions. Um, and, and they're still going to technically compete, obviously, uh, but but I don't know. we'll see. I, I think we're going to see those three companies go very different directions as time goes on. And that's exciting. That's cool. I, I think it's going to be good in the long run. Uh, but we will have to wait and see. Moving into non-platform specific news. Uh, and not even gaming news. But the Fallout TV show has released all eight episodes of season one on Amazon Prime. It is so freaking good. It is. I've only seen parts of The Last of Us show. That show. I think the struggle with The Last of Us is that they have extremely iconic characters. Specifically Joel and Ellie. Who. You know, they 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 casted people who had vague resemblances to them and, and how they're represented in the games, but not really. Um, I know everyone has got real defensive about people 
uh, saying that that girl wasn't a good fit for Ellie. I really don't think she was. And from what I've seen, she's a pretty mediocre actress. And it's fine. She's cool and she's doing her thing. And a lot of people love her performance. So I'm just an outsider. My opinion doesn't matter. Um, I know all of the the episodes I have seen. I've seen a few. She just kind of seems like a mannequin with a speaker in her mouth that's just reciting lines. I don't think she fits the role that well. And it's not because she doesn't look just like Ellie or she's not hot or whatever, you know, when especially, you know, sexualizing. I, I don't know if she, I don't know how old she is, but that's not what matters. I just don't think she represents the character that well. Um, and, you know, with, with Joel, I think he does a better job. Um, for the most part, but it's still not right. And so where, you know, that, that, that series, the last of a series still did such a good job representing and, and trying to embody that video game. I just still think fallout. It has the easier job because it was telling a completely new story, but it just, man, um, what it does so well is that if, even if it didn't have the fallout branding, It would just be a good show. It feels like it's representing a video game, but in a good way. That's typically a bad thing. And then it represents Fallout so good. They did such a good job, even with like the sound design. Like when they use a stem pack, the the healing thing, it sounds just like it does in a game. And even the weapon sounds and sounds so good. And then the visuals, like, the vaults just look so good. They did such a good job with the vaults. It's insane. They they really look so good. They they they, they look so good. They did such a good job. Even the CGI and the animation, for the most part, is really good. There's a few parts where you're like, man, that doesn't look great. But it's a TV show. Who cares? But then, like even like like their uniforms, the 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 vault, you know, uniforms they have. They they don't look like like props like like um in the you know they have them sitting in a dressing room that the material looks thick it looks it looks substantial and man and then the actual story they tell is just so great it's just really 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 good um i think the lady that has the main character um, one of the big thing about vault dwellers in the fallout universe is they're seen as being naive and stuff because they've grown up in these sheltered situations in the vaults over hundreds of years while things have just gone completely crazy on the surface. And they, they picked an actress and they wrote a script that exemplified that for sure. But she, the, but they did a really good job of not making her like a damsel in distress. She was still very powerful, still very competent, um, while also being naive and that really did it was just so good I really really liked it um, there's some really weird stuff they play into in the first in the first episode I don't think this is a big spoiler they they go into some like light incest <laughs> but the way they handle it is like kind of funny and you root for the guy it's weird if you're only hearing that and you haven't seen the show you're gonna think I sound insane because I do But if you watch it, you'll understand. And it's great. They handle it so well. Um, ah, Just a good show. Uh, It it has to get, it has to get another season, Um, especially the way it ends. They very obviously are setting up um, a a, a new, uh, more to the story, like very clearly. Um, But man, so good. If, if you, if you like sci-fi stuff in general, even if you, if you don't know anything about fallout, watch the show if you like fallout definitely watch the show if you just like good tv watch the show that's my opinion so uh, without any spoilers there has been a bunch of uh, chit chat amongst the fallout community especially about how the story may have retconned an entire game i don't think that's necessarily true again without going into spoilers it's hard to talk about it but just who cares? It's fine. Like whatever. The problem is, is that we are probably like six or seven years away from another Fallout game. Like very likely. 
And that's and like there will probably be multiple seasons of that show released before we get to play another game. And the thing to know, if you didn't, that um, Todd Howard, the creator of Fallout and you know Bethesda's guy or the, the modern Fallout games, he wasn't part of one and two or New Vegas. He's already talked about how you know he knows what the next Fallout is. And there were even stories that came out that talked about how he advised the script and the story for the show to not interrupt with his ideas for the next game. So people should realize that, you know, you can probably deduce that very likely, you know, if there, especially if there's multiple seasons of the show, it's going to lead up to the next game, which is super cool, even though it's going to be depressing that I bet we get like three seasons of that show before the next game maybe even gets announced, which is wild because they won't announce it until after or shortly before the next Elder Scrolls game comes out. And they just started that probably this year in like full production. So Fallout TV show, please check it out. It's so good. It's worth it. That's my stamp of approval. Uh, going to the rumor zone, uh, Jeff Grubb reported that Dead Space 2 had a remake um, in early production, but it was uh, shelved after the sales of the 2023 Dead Space 1 remake were disappointing. The story got interesting because EA came out um, and denied the rumor entirely. Uh, this is really out of character for EA. They don't typically address rumors at all uh, because often rumors are like free advertising. Um, so if EA comes out and says like, as like a company, this wasn't even like a random dev or like some, cause Jeff made this, he, he pointed out a moment in the last couple of years where a developer said, you know, that rumor is not true. That rumor ended up being true, but that was just a guy. This is the, the company coming out and saying, if you don't trust EA, if, if you think Jeff Grubb is always right, that's fine. It's just what EA did with this denial, especially over something that isn't like wasn't the biggest deal on earth is pretty significant. In my opinion, it was also notable uh, that other journalists like IGN's Cat Bailey and even Jason Schreier to a lesser degree came out and basically refuted Jeff's statement as well, where Cat Bailey straight up came out and said that, you know, my own sources said that a Dead Space 2 remake was never in production, like, like it was never planned. Um, they don't they don't know what he's talking about. Um, Schreier came out and said something a little more vague that um, the IP uh, that they intended on maybe making a, a new game in the series that their um, motive EA motive was working on their next game and they were con concepting a lot. Dead Space 2 remake was actually never one of those concepts. Possibly the next Dead Space game was. Uh, and then I guess there were some other ideas and then they made them into a battlefield support studio, um, as well as their Iron Man, uh, Marvel game that they're making as well. So this led to, uh, Jeff Grubb doubling down and, um, on his reporting, um, all signs kind of point to though, that he was probably just wrong, uh, and seems kind of unwilling to just admit it. Um, and he's since done some kind of what I would call mental gymnastics to be like, you know, that say that he was technically correct, uh, which is the best kind of correct always. Um, even if he wasn't perfectly accurate, um, I will say I have a little animosity towards Jeff for some other stuff that's happened. Um, but you know, I, my, the opinion I'm feeling, uh, I saw pretty often around, um, this also, is partially why I have I push back a lot on his prediction, quote unquote, about when the next Mass Effect is going to come out. Um, I think ever since he left his journalism job at Games Beat and became kind of like an entertainment personality at Giant Bomb, his you know he's not a journalist anymore. He he doesn't necessarily have to worry about you know hurting his you know his website or his paper or his you know, you know, his, his, you know, whatever, you know, journalistic establishment he's working at about hurting their reputation because no one's worried about giant bomb and how accurate it's reporting is. 
So I just think that, you know, maybe some of his takes have kind of delved more into the sensational and the clickbaity uh, rather than, you know, trying to do some serious reporting, which is fine. You know, he he's doing his job and that's fine. He probably did hear something from someone and either misinterpreted it or got bad info or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I just, I think the doubling down was kind of funny because it kind of seems like he was just wrong. Um, and that happens. Um, there's been times he cut his hair for the first time in many years, uh, and because he probably just got bad info from a good source about the release date of a game that ended up coming out like a year later. Um, it happens. It's not the end of the world. Um, but it just seems like, um, some people handle being incorrect about those things a little differently than others. Uh, speaking of Mass Effect, uh, we had uh, Mass Effect's uh, Shepard canonical birthday uh, this week. Uh, BioWare celebrated with a tweet. We had some people put out videos. We had some conversation going on around uh, that show or you know the that game and the characters. Um, the show uh, that was rumored years ago from Amazon also picked up a little talk this month or this week uh, after the Fallout series came out and uh, was reviewed so well. At one point, I believe it was even confirmed uh, by like Amazon and or Bioware that like, yeah, they're, we're working on something. Um, but, you know, we've heard nothing since. Uh, and then after the Dragon Age Netflix animated series. I don't know how excited people are for anything because apparently it was pretty bad. Um, when it comes to Mass Effect in general, I've definitely kind of slowed down my coverage of it and stuff, and even my gameplay. I've just been playing other stuff. Um, I, I still feel good. It's just, you know, I've talked about it a lot that after the last in seven day, I feel like basically all of my theories got thrown out the window, and I kind of don't know what to talk about. I don't really want to go into the lore of the trilogy or Andromeda because other people have covered that to death and have done it way better than I will. Um, I don't really want to theorize anymore because I don't have any theories. Uh, that last in seven day blew up all my theories and, and, but, and I guess why I'm frustrated or sad or whatever you would call it is that it blew up all my theories and then didn't give us anything to, to go on. So where the 2022 in seven day just gave content creators endless things to speculate and, and, and think about the 2023 to me, at least shut things down and gave us nothing else, which is fine. You know, they, they, they're just, you know, trying to market their game four or five years before it comes out. But, um, I, I'm really curious to what happens this year. And I don't know how much I'll have to talk about <laughs> with mass effect, uh, until the next in seven day, uh, or if some leaks come out or something, or maybe we get some info, you know, soon ish from a blog or something when they start talking more about dragon age Dreadwolf. So I'm excited about mass effect actually here in uh, a couple of weeks, I'll be participating in a stream or podcast, whatever you want to consider it, uh, with a couple of really great folks. I don't think anyone's announced anything yet, so I don't want to uh, go beyond my step, but I am really excited to chat with these people live and kind of have all of us throw out our ideas. Um, the, 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 th the, the group, um, I think we have like general agreement on a lot of things. Um, but I think a lot of our hopes and our, and where and kind of where we're at are very different, uh, with, you know, our coverage of the game. Uh, and so I'm really excited to kind of delve in to that. Uh, Ubisoft, Prince of Persia's Sands of Time remake. Uh, that was shown off of, man, that game was supposed to come out in 2001 or 2021. And after I think it was a trailer in 2020, um, it could have been, maybe it was 21. I can't remember. Uh, it was received so poorly that they stopped, that they canceled the release date. And the rumors are now that they've completely restarted development. They rebooted it entirely. Um, they've replaced the voice actor for the prince, uh, the main character. Uh, it was Yuri Lowenthal, who I believe is the Spider-Man voice actor, as well as other things. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you were looking forward to that Sands of Time remake, 
it's probably going to be a few years at the very least. And a really weird thing, kind of a follow-up to last week, there were rumors about the developer of Dead Cells uh, and Ubisoft doing a collaboration with Prince of Persia. And this week, it, it happened. They uh, released some gameplay footage. Some people um, were able to put out previews where they had played the game. And it looks weird. And it's got like a hip-hop soundtrack. It's got a very cartoony look. Um, it's a very classic side-scroller. It's Dead Cells is what it is, basically. But in the Prince of Persia universe. And um, it's weird. If you would have told me that in the last you know year within a one year span we would get two prince of persia side scrolling games that one would be like very well reviewed and, and really really liked in the uh the, the one actually released by ubisoft i think earlier this year and then there's another one coming early access soon ish from the dead cells dev i would have called you a liar that that would have sounded insane uh but it's happening and i think that's pretty cool so um, as much flack as Ubisoft catches for being Ubisoft, uh, I thought this was pretty great. Um, another thing that happened for Ubisoft this week was they released the story trailer for um, Star Wars Outlaws. This is the game currently being made by the same team that, they, that did The Division 2. Um, it, I thought, looked great. I think it was exactly what I wanted. Um that they there was some dissent from two groups one being the weirdo gamer gate every character needs to look like a sex doll group it, we'll just ignore them um there there were some people who dissented and kind of felt like um it was weird i thought the graphics looked really really good maybe i'm so used to the snowdrop engine from the division that i kind of had an expectation and it was better than my expectation when it came to faces and animations and hair and stuff where maybe if people have a different mindset and they're thinking about like the last of us and maybe some of these like hyper cinematic games and it wasn't as good as that um now i did see people being like oh it looks like a last gen game and that like kind of makes me roll my eyes because it definitely didn't um regardless i'm really excited to see something from star wars outlaws this is a game that i have right up there with hellblade 2 um, with my kind of early favorites for game of the year for me. Um, and what I'm excited for is it seems like they're putting together a fun story um, that has a Han Solo vibes, in my opinion. Um, a game that I think looks extremely good. And then now we need gameplay. We need to play it, right? I love the way that The Division 2 feels and plays. And so I expect this is going to be very different than that. Um, but I think it's going to be in a good way. And, I, and, I, and I'm sure the things that feel good about the division have at least informed, you know, the development of this game. And I'm really excited to see how they kind of piece those things together. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm super pumped. Uh, they put out a release date that for that. I believe it's August 30th. Um, so here at the end of the summer. And I will, um, I'll be on that. I'll be very excited to, uh, to play that, review it, you know, do all the things. And, um, basically what I'm hoping for, for from it is to be like a Jedi survivor type game. You know, if it has that kind of playtime, that kind of emotional impact, that kind of story and characters, not a perfect game, not a 10 out of 10 necessarily, but a very strong eight or maybe even nine out of 10, uh, would be super super cool and would definitely rank pretty high in my book uh hitting some of our quicker stories here um ea did announce that battlefield 2042 season 7 will be the final bit of content for that game um uh, and and from there they're focusing on the next game um that one has been rumored a bit that it may be a game that takes place in a similar time frame um as 2042 likely being a direct sequel but probably learning all the lessons that they learned from Battlefield 2042, especially the launch, which wasn't great. Um, it was actually pretty bad. Uh, what's funny is that within 12 months, even six months, in my opinion, 2042, they, they made some major changes quickly. And I really think 2042 is a really, really good game. It's my favorite Battlefield since four, probably. Um, I liked one and five. Um, but I, I think 2042 is better. Uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for modern 
warfare stuff. So maybe that's why, but yeah, it, it's interesting. So, um, from my previous story, you know, we know EA Motive will be working on this next game. Uh, we also know that Criterion, uh, former Need for Speed devs, and Ripple Effect will all be assisting DICE in making this next Battlefield. Um, and then, yeah, we had the rumors about the setting. So that will probably come sooner than people think. I wouldn't be surprised if the next Battlefield is 2025 and maybe we start hearing about it this year, at least teases. Um, I really hope they don't they don't dare try to do that Tarkov ish mode again, which is, I think what the whole 2042 was supposed to be. I, um, I have conspiracy theories that 2042 was supposed to be a big extraction game. Um, and then late in development and testing, people were like, this isn't fun because they put out that mode along with the multiplayer and no single player. Right. And my guess is that in testing, they basically figured out that people, just didn't like the extraction mode and they didn't know how to make it better. So they poured probably all their last minute resources into the multiplayer, but they have these things like these, like uh, kind of overwatch style, like set like characters in the game and they're awful and they talk too much. And, um, and, and they really just, it's weird. Cause you'll see like four of the same character running around the maps all together. And it just, I, I hate it. I hate it. I want just random NPCs for the next game. Don't I don't need to be a a class, you know, a character. Uh, just make it a class based game like it should be, and um, and I suspect they'll do that. I still would be surprised if they do like a heavy story, like a sto- like a single player story in the next Battlefield. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they do kind of a um, Titanfall one type of deal where they tell a like pretty decent story through the multiplayer. Uh, where it's kind of like integrated into just your normal gameplay. That could be really cool. But uh, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But I love Battlefield. I saw some people kind of rolling their eyes about EA Motive not making a Dead Space game and instead helping with Battlefield. EA Motive is a really good studio. And um, I, I love that they're working on a series that I really, really love. Uh, in a quick story, Apple opens all their, their app store to game emulators as long as they follow all applicable laws. So we'll see how long it takes for Nintendo to sue them for that. And the YouTube channel Gamers, spelled with a, a V instead of A, um, started a Patreon push to ensure they can continue making documentaries and other game-related videos. For me, there was like this like tier... <laughs> of like game reviewers and in historians and documentarians. So you have like no clip, you have Nike Jakey, you've got like Reykjavik. Um, and then like below that you have gamers gamers is like kind of the more like corny or, you know, kind of cheesy version of it, but it's still really good. And they talk and they, and they they've done some really, really good videos. Apparently they're a team of like four or five people, which isn't that surprising because they don't put out that many videos. Um, and apparently this Patreon push was like super, super successful and they should be safe at least for now. So uh, it's always good to see people who have, who are actually successful at this stuff, being able to keep doing it. Uh, you know, maybe one day, you know, I've, I've already been doing this stuff for, um, gosh, since 2000, about seven years, maybe in seven more years, I'll finally make it. Uh, but probably not. And that's okay. I enjoy doing it either way. And that is where I'm going to wrap up the show. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please consider supporting all of my content by watching, listening, sharing, and following my socials or throwing a few bucks my way via the link tree link in the description of the show and all of the various ways you can help me out in there. That is all I have for this episode of the Bonfire Podcast. So, until next time.